final installment of our Cloud Horizons Public Sector Series. We're zooming in on K-12. Joined by Hillsborough County Public Schools, tune in as we explore how Cloud Tech helped the Florida-based school district enhance its operations. This is RPI Tech Connect, and we are back for yet another exciting discussion. I'm your host, Chris Airy, and this is part three of our Cloud Horizons Public Sector Series. For today's episode, we're focusing on education and how cloud technology is transforming the way schools operate, from addressing infrastructure challenges to retooling administrative processes. Cloud solutions are having a huge impact in the K-12 space. To help us explore this further, I'm thrilled to welcome two guests today. Bob St. Ledger from Infor and Rick Leno from Hillsborough, Hillsborough County Public Schools, one of RPI's clients. Bob, welcome back. Rick, welcome to the program. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's wonderful to have you both uh, on here with me today. Um, before we dive into today's topic, could you give our listeners a quick introduction to your, uh, you know, about your background, particularly uh, within K-12 and cloud technology? Bob, we can start with you. Yeah, again, thanks, Chris and Rick. I'm glad, excited to be here. I'm uh, part of the public sector strategy team, and I focus on a lot of segments within the public sector. Uh, we're going to be talking today about K-12, and that's one of the big sweet spots that Infor provides solutions to the K-12 industry. So again, and I've worked a lot with Rick, our next speaker, is he's been part of our public sector industry council for many years. So again, uh, exciting to have Rick on with us. Thanks, Bob. Rick? Yeah, it's great to be here. I've dedicated my entire career to Hillsborough County Public Schools. I started as a system programmer supporting an IBM mainframe, and I'm proud and a little bit embarrassed to say I've reached this milestone in my life, my fourth decade of service. You know, I've had a variety of titles, including data center manager for 14 years. I spent a couple of years as the uh, IT Office of Compliance. Um, last six years, I've been a general manager of information technology. Uh, I did spend the first two and a half years sitting at the sea level as a GM role until a chief technology officer position was created, to which I now currently report. As for the ERP experience, I was one of the two project managers responsible for six, successfully implementing the um, what the original Lawson program back in early 2000s. Uh, additionally, I oversaw the implementation of our imaging solution we're still using to date around the same time period. Our, our for cloud, though, our, our district has been leveraging cloud resources for over a decade. We start with the, with the Microsoft storage and Azure infrastructure as a service, utilizing the various applications hosted on either AWS and Azure. Recently, we've mig migrated over to Infor, which we'll talk about today, and the human capital management, as well as cloud suite financials, and the single tenant version of payroll and workforce management. Uh, that's plenty to start with, I guess, Chris. No, that, uh, thanks, Rick. That was, uh, I appreciate you sharing that background. I didn't know you had been, uh, 40 years in a Hillsborough. Is that right? Yeah, a little, little long. That's why I say it's a little hard to imagine in one place for that long, but this is my 41st year in technology and never was an educator, always been IT, IT trained and, and improved. Awesome. Well, I'll, I'll, you know, love to hear your perspective today. And with that, I, you know, I think we can jump right in. You know, I hear uh, K through 12 schools are facing a number of challenges with aging infrastructure and tight budgets and, uh, of course, evolving educational needs. So, Rick, you know, throughout your experience, how uh, how have you been addressing these issues and, and how was it impacting Hillsborough or how was uh, it? Yeah, uh, I, I should have started with that. Uh, we're also to give you some background. We're the seventh largest nation in the nation, seven largest school district, I should say in the nation, with over 220,000 students and over 24,000 employees. And historically, we've dealt with funding issues across the district and IT has never been at the top of any of the list for funding. You know, Even our, our five-year hardware refresh plan was put on hold for several years. Um, so we struggled to keep our data center running with the complexity of our HR payroll and finance applications primarily due to the limited staff resources available for the span of required resources. It's amazing from the mainframe to open systems and networking, you know, staff turnover and retirements add additional strain. Uh, so it's hard to keep staff. And as you guys are aware, even in the, uh, in the private sector, it's been hard, hard to maintain technical staff in the last three years. So you can imagine from a school district that pays a fraction what that's like. 
Uh, another issue we face is the time it takes to procure hardware. Uh, mm-hmm. If we need to expand our storage or capacity, our procurement timeline from initial request to bid to board approval to delivery can exceed four months. So capacity, pl- you know, planning becomes a real critical issue. So it's been it's been fun times working with the the different problems that we have. All that being said, when COVID hit us, I believe our average personal computer age was around eight years old. We had to scramble to initially hand out over 50,000 personal computers for remote access for students and staff. Overnight, our instructional staff had to pull together and create online curriculum in the cloud-based learning management system. Fortunately, we had just procured one and got it up and running about six months before COVID hit us. So the evolving education needs changed overnight for all districts across the country. So I'm sure other districts have the same issues we're facing today. You said you had to issue uh, personal computers to students as well? Yes, absolutely. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I hope that, you know, those are some complex sounding challenges. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, COVID was nothing anyone was prepared for. But I'm hoping that maybe some of these challenges are things of the past now since you're on the cloud. Is that right? Uh, definitely. Uh, unfortunately, not all our systems are off the mainframe yet. We must maintain, you know, some of the systems for retention for a little bit longer. But, um, you know, the cloud solution provided just such great assistance, I'll say. There are a few things that kept me up at night and continue to, but the cloud addressed them. I, you know, we'll go into them probably later, but like disaster recovery. I'll say mm. one of the top two in my, my mind is disaster recovery and security enhancements because, you know, being from a district here in Florida, you know, anything that we're in an area prone for hurricanes. So, you know, oh. now that we're in the cloud, geographical redundant locations, you know, mitigates this challenge. So I don't even have to worry about that anymore. Security enhancements, you know, info, info possesses significant financial resources to support their solutions, enabling them to provide and sustain enhanced levels of application and network security that, you know, districts can't, can't keep up to, up to speed with. So those are just two examples we'll start with that, uh, yeah, made our, made our lives much easier, and I sleep much better at night. That's something I didn't even think about. There, you know, having your your on premise system in an area where you have real, you know, weather risks all the time. Like, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Now, is that right? Am I understanding you correctly? That's correct. I mean, we uh. we basically have our our data centers on our third floor, so I never worried about flooding in downtown Tampa, but. If you don't have electricity getting to that building, they turn it off. It's kind of hard to maintain uh, uptime. <laughs> wow. Well, it sounds like the transition to cloud technology couldn't have come at a better time. And uh, Bob, from your perspective, what are the main reasons school districts like Hillsborough are moving to the cloud? What do you What do you see uh, from your perspective? Yeah, and a good question. Actually, I want to kind of reiterate some of the comments that Rick just made. Like, certainly, two of the big ones are the disaster recovery. Um, as well as security enhancements. You know, from a disaster recovery standpoint, um, organizations don't have the staff today to make sure they always have their backups done in a timely manner. Or if, if there's some kind of a crazy storm in the West, we have more fire issues than storms. Um, but same kind of thing, like you have to be able to ensure that you have um, backup plans, backup data centers, all that um, set up for you. The other thing I'll comment too is like security enhancements and stuff. For the most part, the on-premise legacy applications have their own series of security challenges. Um, keeping up to date with whatever patches and releases are there is a big ordeal. When you have to, when you can stop worrying about that, that frees your staff up to do things that are more um, important, really, for your your K twelve school district in particular. The other thing I'll add too, Rick, you also mentioned um, trying to procure hardware is a challenge. When you go to the cloud, you really don't worry about hardware anymore because you can have um, expansive ways to um, add and, and decrease um, needs based on the, the people using the application. So again, those are some of the, I'd say, more technical reasons for um, moving to the cloud and making sure your K-12 district is in the cloud. And again, yeah, I also want to add, you're, you're, you're number seven in the country. That's huge. You guys have a huge um, um, demand set, a huge application. I think the cloud made a lot of sense for you. Yeah, Bob, that, that number four, that hardware capacity planning, or I call it, you know, capacity on demand is what the cloud really provides. That was my third after security enhancements. Mm-hmm. That, that's my third because, you know, being able to forecast out what you're going to need uh, no longer is a concern of mine <laughs> because, mm-hmm. you, you know, you've already got shared resources. You guys can turn it up in the cloud and turn it down where we have to wait, even think of it from delivery um, aspects. 
So when you need it, it's there. Yeah. And, and Bob, you mentioned something there that uh, I've heard a lot about recently too. And it's this, it's the way that updates are deployed. It sounds like they happen like in the background, non-disruptive to people's work days. Is there anything you can share there? Yeah, it's a good uh, good question. That all we, of course, every uh, month there are periodic updates for critical issues that may have been occurring. But generally, I think a lot of software vendors like ourselves go to twice annual um, major enhancement releases, which get deployed and passed out. So after we are fully tested and QA them, then we make them available to the clients. And they can toggle them on and off, so they don't have to turn them on until they're ready for them. But Certainly, all that happening behind the scenes is a big change to having to you know, find your servers, apply your patches, make sure it's the right patch, and then repeat everything two days later when the new patch comes out. So again, all this is happening behind the scenes. I think Rick can probably testify that that's going to give his team time to do other things that are more critical to the, the district. <laughs> we will agree it a lot, Bob. In some areas, we might have a little gray area. I mean, Changes are changes. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to your point, though, behind the scene ones, the operating system level, I take those for granted. Uh, once you get to the yep. updates twice a year, we still have to do some testing and anything that we've customized. So, uh, you know, I don't want your listeners to think that it all goes away. But if if seventy percent of it goes away, that's a that's a, that's a yeah. nice. Yeah, that's great insight. Uh, now, Rick, I understand that Hillsborough County Public Schools recently transitioned to Infor Cloud Suite. I think that was January of twenty twenty four. Um, can you walk us through the early stages of this journey? You know, what were some of the immediate challenges you faced? And, uh, yeah, what was that process like for you? It was a long journey for us. It's going to be different for every every corporation, though. Some of them I'm actually jealous of because it would be probably straightforward and easy with less <laughs> customization. So I'd love to work for one of the simple ones. But, you know, our, our, our migration was, like I said, it's not typical. We were one of the handful of original loss and customers running their ERP on a three-tiered platform, including a mainframe. And, you know, in addition, we were so back level uh, in the software version, we had to complete two conversions to get to the cloud-supported version. Um, that was on us. You know, to further complicate the legacy system, we had over 400 custom programs that we replaced Lawson with that we addressed and built ourselves. So... The straightforward part is establishing, you know, cloud environments. You know, you do the subscription. We opted for production test and training environments. So three environments for each, uh, one for the, you know, cloud suite financials, the human capital management. Uh, both of those were done in the multi-tenant environment, which I highly recommend. Uh, WFM, and which is the what's workforce management module, uh, and loss and V10, we did those in single tenant environments so we could take some of our customizations with us as a stepping stone to get to that multi-tenant. Um, so that being said, I want everybody to understand, you know, we're not the one and done type. We, we were quite a complicated uh, situation uh, that we had to get out of and get on a supported version. Um, you know, N4 resources were contracted for the implementation and conversion of our historical data. We also had, you know, over 20 years of data in these data files <laughs> that had to be converted. Uh, the Infor contract included a project manager, manager, and uh, we began back actually in 2018. So that's how long this project has for us, um, due to our uniqueness. Uh, you know, Infor supplied their standard scripts and you know all their experts for the configuration and training. You know, over the implementation, we we did several mock go lives uh, that we completed. They can, like I said, they converted over the 20 years of data, revealing you know areas that needed to be addressed uh, through software and process adjustments. Uh, there was multitude of reasons causing delays besides COVID. And in some instances, uh, you know, we even lost subject matter expertise on our team within the district, you know, that added to the project complexities. Uh, overall, our district was able to reduce the number of customizations by at least 75%, you know, at our actual go live. Um, part of the, the transition, though, right, right the year before we went live with the final push to go live, we brought in an independent uh, company. To complete a review, uh, the the CFO at the time wanted to see a review of the project and see what the delays were. Suffice it to say, at that time, we were able to bid for staff augmentation to assist with the tasks the district is required to complete and maintain. So in November, last November, uh, the, uh, actually in November 23, the, uh, the district uh, issued the bid for staff augmentation services. RPI was awarded the that bid in May of 2024. Um, However, 
with the importance of the go live with procurement requirements, the district began to use RPI expertise, you know, to help address production issues as soon as we went live, right as Infor's contract was ending. Um, so we had Infor contracted up through the two months after go live, and then then we we're going to run it from that point forward. So RPI okay. is critical from that point forward to assist us. That's awesome. It sounds like some unique challenges um, you face there. And it sounded like you were quite thorough too, though. I heard, did I hear multiple test environments? Is, is that right? Yes, we have a, we use three, which is usually you people only have two. We have a third one we actually use for training. So we have a test, a training and a production. Oh, that's, that's great to hear. I, you know, something that we encourage here at RPI and during implementation, post implementation, basically at any stage is facilitating training. So, uh, you know, you said RPI won the staff augmentation bid and, and began that in May. I imagine there's been some training involved in that. Is that true? Yes, it has. Uh, actually, they, they started prior to May. I mean, that was the main contract. But like I said, for the, some of the procurement things, as we tr- transitioned over to the uh, go live in January and right thereafter, some of the critical um, things we had to deal with, they were, they were not helping us out. Um, also, now and going forward, I mean, they're, they're weekly with each of our functional areas, uh, working with our subject matter experts, um, training them and doing knowledge transfer directly to them. So that, that's been a, a great assist with their experience and knowledge of the product. It's, it's really key to our success. I'm always happy to hear uh, good things about the RPI uh, services team from, from clients. So thank you for that, Rick. Um, earlier you had mentioned, you know, retooling staff and updating some processes. You know, you mentioned the 75% customization reduction. How did your team approach this and, and what role did RPI play in getting that uh, to happen? Uh, well, at the, at the time, that was prior to the, the conversions and the, um, the customization for prior to the RPI. And so Infor really worked with us on those. Um, most of the the jobs that we ran over, you know, we are still running Lawson. So that that's part of our, it's like a two-step approach. We're still using Lawson now V10 in the cloud. It's no longer on-premise. So we do eliminate all the frustrations and, and problems that we have uh, on on-premise, you know, ma- maintenance. But we we couldn't walk away from all the customizations we had. Um, so Infor helped us uh, direct those. Now, after now that we're live, and let's just say that was the first the first phase is to get our up up and running on a, a supported version. That was the main mission. It, it's hard to push that through at the executive level because from the end customer level, they're still getting the same AP checks and payroll checks, and financers are getting done. So externally, you don't get to see the risks that we're having behind the scenes with code that's not supported. Um, so phase two now is going to be okay. How do we make that? efficiency improve you know we were already coming from a loss in system that was online so now it's how do we make that more modern start getting into mobile applications start being able to change that front end the interface so it's more pleasing to the uh, customer uh, uh, so that's where rpi uh, okay. will come along and start you know using the tools that they have experience with and, and working alongside our our subject matter experts they'll be guiding us into making it more efficient so thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you mentioned it too. So, you know, uh, getting to the cloud is not the end all be all. It's just step mm-hmm. one. And, and around these parts, once an organization has gone live on cloud suite, we begin what we like to call the day two optimization, which is like the activities that you're talking about here, where you're really trying to maximize the value of this these new applications that you've installed, you know, it's, it's making those fine tune adjustments and, and getting things to, you know, really improve. Well, so, and, and I'll add to that too, Chris, I mean, some of them aren't even just fine tuning. Sometimes it's just the expertise and knowledge. It's like, well, why did you do it this way when this way is so much easier? So it's directing oh. you to something with experience. Whereas, you know, as we're looking at it or, or evaluating our process, it, it may be a, a, a major tune than just a fine tune. Could be I see. That really makes it more effective immediately. That's uh, that's actually, um, and we'll get to this later in our in our discussion here. But uh, a previous guest had had mentioned like you don't know what you don't know, mm. and it, that's the value that you ha- you get when you bring in experts to kind of look, take a look at your system and say, like to describe what you just said there. But the, you're you're doing it this way, and that way it works. But it can be done 
faster and more efficient and, and probably in a, in a more streamlined way. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that there. Um, Bob, if I just add too, like the whole, I love the idea of staff augmentation because um, I think some something that often clients forget and implementation partners forget is that Rick and his team have a day job. So, and it's not just to the, go to the cloud, that's part of what they're doing. So you really have to make sure that you have the, the staff that can help with the cloud migration, but also keep keep the lights on and keep doing the things you need to do until you're in the cloud. So Rick, you're probably at a double um, double shot of work doing, going on there for a long time. Yeah. And I, I think that's strong and worth mentioning. I mean, in our particular implementation, and when somebody looks at the timelines and says, what happened to the timeline? You know, we didn't, we didn't backfill our position. So none of our, our teams functional or technical, actually stop their day job to your point, Paul. So we were running production through all the time. And, and sometimes, you know, obviously production took priority over over the, the project. So that did add to, um, and, and nothing changed, you know, nothing stopped changing across those years. You know, any new statue, we have to change our existing system in order to keep going with it. So it was interesting. I, I do recommend, if at all possible, obviously, any new engagement, you backfill a position and free up a, a unit to, to you know, dedicate to a, a conversion type. If I just to like a funny story, I was talking to a client last week who went live on HCM payroll and WFM in 12 months. And 12 months is like, no, no one ever does in 12 months. <laughs> and I said, I congratulate him on that. And they said, well, we will never do it again. <laughs> so <laughs> they're in the process again, their own staff augmentation saying, so you know, go for the next phase. And again, that was all our HCM stuff to the FSM. They even touched it, but they just, it was overwhelming. So it's a lot of, it's a lot to expect. Yeah. I like, I like Chris's uh, day two. I'm going to start coining that <laughs> using that instead of our phase two, because it really is a day two is okay. Now we're here. Okay. Now it's available. Yeah, thank you. I don't. It wasn't me who came up with it, but somebody at RPI said it, and now it's this <laughs> internal thing. That's what we call it. But I've I've been slowly inserting it into outward facing things. So I'm glad you're a fan. I'll 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 relay that back. It might be year two for us, but it. Both <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, well, I appreciate you both speaking to the benefits of staff augmentation. Uh, you know, we're happy to provide those services here at RPI. Uh, Bob, so a couple questions for you. Uh, you know, we've heard about Hillsborough's account with transitioning to the cloud and, and um, life after going live. Uh, how does Cloud Suite help schools optimize their operations, and, and what does it offer beyond just being an ERP? I'd say a lot of this. Good question. But a lot of this ties back to um, what used to be called back office, because the you know the exciting financials, general ledger, even HCM payroll. That's never that exciting for the the teachers or the people in the front lines, et cetera. But if you don't have a strong backbone uh, run by a team like Rick's running, then you don't have modernization and the capability to do a lot more for your frontline workers. So I think that's the big part that people often forget about. You really have to modernize and have a platform that's going to take you into the future because you don't have that to begin with around financials, around procurement, around HCM, around workforce management stuff. Then when your workers and your teachers, your administrators, your even your students are trying to access um, capabilities in the internet, if you don't have the backbone, then they they have no way to access that as well. Yeah, that, that's great. And it, it reminds me of something. So uh, myself and the rest of the marketing team at RPI, we attended a conference in Boston last week. And uh, one of the presenters was sharing the story about uh, the software that his company deploys and he, he started his uh, presentation with, raise your hand if your parents have more than one uh, TV remote. And I was like, <laughs> what? Where is he going with this? It's like, it was like name, raise your hand if your parents have more than five. And like, you know, a couple people's hands went up. I was like, where's he going? And then what it came down to was that like the software that he had, and I think that, you know, Infor Cloud Suite uh, plays the same role, is that like with this tool, you only need one remote. And I think ERP is the same, you know, in for cloud suite ERP is the same here. It's like you can manage and have greater visibility into everything from one place. So I share that. And I hope that <laughs> it, it sounds relevant to you, but when I heard it, that's what immediately clicked in my mind. So I, I can't wait to get to that day myself. I mean, like I said, I'm in my fourth decade, but until <laughs> internally, once we get to the point where we do have the data, and keep in mind, so this is, you know, our financial data. Now, as a, as a school district, now we want to fold in the student data as well. So capabilities are there, and that goes into that day, day, day two, 
you know, now that we're here, how do we move that forward? So we get that single pane of glass as the old term we used to use. Nice. Um, well, Richard, you know, I know that it's still early, but Hillsboro has been live. You know, what kind of results are you seeing or what are you hoping for? And how has this transition helped streamline your operations? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping for exactly what you guys just talked about. Um, we're, we're, we're still, I mean, it's, it's relatively new since it's January. You know, we haven't even made it through, you know, this fiscal year. But um, as we, you know, and the challenges we face, part of it was data conversion. You know, so as, as we get across and we're going back so far, um, our immediate challenge was, you know, reconciling some of the financials, not due to anything on the system. But, you know, the decision we made is to keep our production legacy system running while while the conversion was taking place and to convert 20 plus years of data uh, in different manual steps. It was it was about a three week process. So we had to go back and reconcile. And that's where I, RPI really came in critical to reconcile some of the financial records, because what we had to do is those that didn't get converted. We had to then identify and bring back into the current system, the new system. So we're still working through some growing pains there. Um, and then we're starting to look into the, the reporting. So I think when you talk to our other functional area leads or when you hear from them, when we get back in another month or so. Um, that's when we'll start to see, you know, once we get through this initial auditing period, I'll, I'll say, we'll start to see the light at the end of the tunnel and then um, be able to take advantage. It'd be interesting that have an interview in about another six months to see where we're at, to see. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we're pacing well and uh, you're optimistic about where things are headed and already mm -hmm. seeing some, some, you know, great outcomes. So thank you mm -hmm. for sharing that with us. Um, we know we are getting close to time now, but uh, as uh, Bob knows, before, uh, before we conclude, I like to ask my guests to impart one, you know, piece of wisdom or an actionable takeaway regarding, uh, you know, today's topic. So, um, Rick, I'd like to start with you. If you could uh, share one piece of advice to school districts considering a move to the cloud, what would it be? One, I, I can't limit it to one. I'm trying to, think. <laughs> <laughs> to me, I, I mean, right now what we're doing is kind of a little backwards because now we're mapping our existing processing. If you, if you want some practical advice from me, the first step is to make sure you have your existing profit processes mapped. And, and not even so much mapped, but, you know, the documentation of why something exists. Sorry, right, it's one thing. I'll tie it together with a couple of things. But, you know, why something exists is the key to success. If it's not required by regulatory or provided added efficiency, eliminate it. You know, get rid of that process. Um, you know, I, I look at customizations as a four-letter word, right? Multi-tenant cloud will improve your sleep. That, that's just that's an, an assessment on top of that. <laughs> processes. And I'll end, I'll, I'll end, I'm whatever. sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. I, I was that that was a great one liner right there. <laughs> your, uh, uh, multi tenant will improve your sleep quality. Is that what you said? Yeah, that's exactly what I said. That's my, my, vision. <laughs> okay. Because I mean, for those people, you know, the end customers won't understand that, but technical people that, that are listening to this will. Um, and I, I'll, I'll end with one other thing. Last comment, not a, not a suggestion, but it's one of my favorites. You know, I know I, I saw, you know, Elon Musk in an interview and he said something like one of the worst things an engineer can do is to make a process more efficient that should not exist at all. And, and that, that just oh. sounds in my ears because when I go back and look over the last six years, you know, when we, when we start looking at something, it's like, well, why were we doing that in the first place? Well, it was something we did 23 years ago. Well, it's not pertinent. So it, it's really if you so back to this all wraps up into one thing, map your existing processes and make sure you need them and make sure what they are. And then you look at the, the, the cloud solution and, and cross reference it. To them. So that's that's my input. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so many good sound bites there, too. I'm going to I'm going to have to quote you on that, Rick. Hope that's all right. Well, I, I, I know I probably didn't get Elon Musk quote exactly right, but it's up there. I'm sure. <laughs> Bob, anything to add? Yeah, I'll just add that. Those are great points, Rick. Uh, maybe just add to that is, that, I mean, the cloud is here. So, um, you know, a lot of times the public sector uh, takes a bit for those organizations to really migrate to the cloud. Uh, but I think the cloud is here. I think in the next um, one to five years, we'll see the majority of K-12 organizations looking to cloud solutions, the ones that haven't already. And they'll have a um, probably three to five, maybe 10-year plan to get to the cloud. But I think that's here. So I'd say as you make your plans to go to the cloud, figure out what is most important to you. Is it really trying to make sure you get rid of any customization you might have from on-prem 
application. Maybe it's focusing on your procurement practices. Maybe it's providing better um, self-service and mobility for um, your employees so they can do their HR capabilities, their benefits enrollment online and stuff. So those are things. Really prioritize what it is you'd like to get done first um, as you lead into your year two, year three, or day two, day three, whatever you end up calling it. (laughs) Well, great advice from both of you. Thank you so much for hanging out. Uh, For those of you joining us on the show today, if you have any questions about today's discussion or you want to learn more about Infor Cloud Suite, feel free to uh, contact us. You can do so at podcast at rpic.com. Again, that's podcast at rpic.com. This is RPI Tech Connect, and I'm your host, Chris Airy. We'll see you next time.